Company. Welcome, everyone that's, that's here. And um, we thought this would be, um, this is a topic that we presented at Fall Conference. It was one of the breakout sessions, and we had some uh, great attendance and questions. And so we thought this would be a great opportunity to um, meet as a webinar so that it's saved for prosperity. And so we know that we've got some agents and specialists out there that give media interviews all the time. And so our goal is to prepare our um, extension agriculture personnel, whoever um, is watching this webinar, our goal is to prepare you to give a media interview. So by equipping you with some simple strategies and, um, you know, a lot of us think of media interviews as stressful and something that we don't like to do or help. I might not say the right thing or I might look funny or, you know, I get nervous and don't know what to say. We hope that um, by taking a few of these um, simple strategies that we're going to offer today that you'll see media interviews as fun and that um, you'll also see them as a way to connect with your community. This is one of the... Um, probably simplest um, ways to whatever you'd like to talk about. You know, this is a way to um, get your information out to your audience and to your community. So we hope that you'll see it as fun and um, use this as a way to connect uh, with your audience. So with that, let me see here. So to get started, we're going to ask you to do a little work to begin. And so we want to kind of set the stage to um, doing a media interview. So we're going to ask you to either use the chat pod or feel free to um, uh, talk out loud. Um, and we want you to um, think of a scenario. And that scenario is, what are a couple of the biggest issues in your county um, or in your region, if you're one of our uh, regional or district people or in your subject matter, if you're a state specialist, um, what's going on during this time of the year um, that might be an issue in your area? So we're going to give you a minute or so to uh, think that up. And like I said, feel free to write it in the um, chat pod. Looks like Becky is providing some examples. And so feel free to add yours as well. Marissa, I'm going to play devil's advocate with you a little bit. Is there a role for extension? That is really cool. I had no idea Center was just announced as the updated Center of North America. Maybe if you could select something that you would have an extension educational role in, it might be easier as we go through the scenarios. Hey, supply for the winter, that's a great one. Wonderful, thanks. Mm -hmm. Looks like Dean is typing a message. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, let's think up something for Dean. <laughs> <laughs> How about the whole concept of participation ribbons? Participation versus, you know, winners. That's kind of a controversial issue in your work. Um, what else? What, what else might you have to do an interview for? Or let's really have fun with Dean. <laughs> uh, a steer dies at the state fair or animal animal care at the state fair would be the issue the animal rights protesters show up he's going not going to touch it no <laughs> <laughs> send him to somebody else hmm 
says okay. Some great issues. Thanks for sharing, mm -hmm. you two. Definitely. So we've thought up these scenarios. We're going to come back to those in just a minute. But um, so so you have an issue going on in your county, and let's say someone within the media, whether that's a radio personality or TV or possibly the newspaper in town, calls you and says, hey, I'd like to get together and talk about what's going on in your area. And you think, oh, my gosh, what do I do? So the first step is to develop a key message. So you might be thinking, well, what is a key message and how do I do that? So a key message is the number one thing you want your audience to do, not just know. So it's not um, getting on the radio and saying, well, we've got this this problem with, um, let's see, what did, uh, let me go back to the chat pod. Marissa said, hay supply for the winter. So we don't just get on and say, well, we've got this problem, but I'm not sure what to tell you to do about it. Um, so a key message is what you want your audience to do, not just know. Um, we want to provide a simple and specific message, not too many options. Um, Two or three key messages is perfect, and uh, we want them to be in complete sentences. So we're gonna, I'm going to take you through a quick little example of how to create a key message. So we've got the choosemyplate.gov graphic here in front of this, in front of us, and this was um, developed by uh, Secretary Vilsack with the Department of Agriculture. Um, and so this was released. And so let's say we were going to use this graphic in um, something that we were putting out in the media. Maybe we were talking about um, a healthy, you know, what, what someone should put on their plate to be healthy in a newspaper column. And so we give them this um, graphic. So one of the key messages we could develop about this graphic would be to eat healthier, right? That's what that's what we're inspiring people to do, right, with this graphic. But we're not really telling them how to do that. So that's pretty vague to just say eat healthier, right? So let's try to make it a little more specific. Well, we could look at this graphic and say, well, um, based on this, we want people to eat a little more than 25% vegetables, eat a little less than 25% fruit, um, eat a little more than 25% grains and a little less than 25% protein. Well, that's pretty, I mean, that's kind of hard to, um, someone could, if we give them that key message and they take that home and they look at their own plate, they go, well, gosh, I don't know, do I have 25% vegetables or less than 25% protein? I'm not sure. So that's pretty hard to understand as well. So let's say they look at this graphic and um, our key message is learn more about food and nutrition. Well, how do I learn more about food and nutrition? That really doesn't tell them anything either. So to develop a better key message, we could say this. Based on this graphic, make half of everything you eat fruits and vegetables. That's pretty simple, right? We can look at a plate and say, half of everything on my plate is fruits and vegetables. Or we could say, use smaller plates to help you eat less. Those are two very simple and specific key messages re related to an issue, eating healthier, that we could provide that people could instantly do and would have no problem understanding right off the bat. Make half of everything you eat, fruits and vegetables, use a smaller plate. So that's a very simple way to think about creating key messages. So now we're going to ask you all to practice. Let's go back to the scenarios that you wrote down in the chat pod or that you thought about. So. And then we're, and we're going to have you write down a key message related to that scenario. So again, not just what you want people to know, but what you want them to do. So Marissa wrote down hay supply for the winter. So what would you want livestock producers in your area to do about providing enough hay in the wintertime, not just know about a shortage? So um, take some time and do that. And looks like... That's a great key message, Marissa. Calculate how much hay you will need for your herd each day. That's great. Related to sump pumps, Becky typed in, 
check your sump pump now to prepare for potential flooding. Those are great. One of the scenarios that I had thought of was um, related to the Stepping On Falls Prevention Program. So, um, so you know, let's say a, a radio personality calls and says, "Hey, what's something going on right now in the community that um, is a focus?" And you could say, "Well, gosh, with all the ice and snow we've had so far this winter, um, falls are a really big problem that we have." And um, you know, some information about that is that seniors are you know more likely to fall than those in the you know 34 to 45 age categories category that's some great information but where's the key message in that the key message might be um, wear shoes that have extra grip during the winter time to reduce your chance of falls or use handrails when you're walking in the winter time to reduce your chance of falls that gives someone a very specific key message about how to prevent falls during that you know during the winter time so we want to you know um, shrink the change in terms of um, you know in terms of not making it too broad being specific giving them an actionable item and keeping it um, to a complete sentence so it's like we've had a few more people join us but those are great messages key messages good job you all you guys so Dean I see that you typed in that 4-H members spend a lot of time with their animals ensuring they are fed and cared for is there a way we could take that a step um, a step further in terms of practicing key message writing with that um, I always think of a great way to start a key message is with a verb. So, um, if the audience is is the 4 H'er themselves, mm -hmm. it could be um, feed and water your livestock in a timely manner to ensure that they are, you know, well taken care of. Um, Becky, can you think of anything? That was exactly what I was going to say. It, Dean is in a unique position here since he's working with the kids more than the media. So that's a good statement. It's a little different than what you might have to deal with sometimes, though. Mm -hmm. but, but that's the kind of thing you might be interviewed about, Dean, and because we said, you know, animal rights or something like that. Yep. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So we've got some good practice in. You guys are doing a great job. So let's talk about preparation. Now, we started off this webinar with saying, you know, a media interview doesn't have to be scary. Um, I think when you sometimes get a phone call, you can kind of instantly go into panic mode about, what do I say? What do I do? Well, um, it really helps to prepare ahead of time. So. Um, writing out your key message is a great way to um, practice what that might be. Um, just myself, before this webinar, I wrote down some of my key messages um, and practiced th saying them out loud so that I could get my point across better when it came time to do this webinar. So also take the time to bridge to your key messages in your interviews. Um, it can be easy to kind of get caught up during the interview and what someone's asking you, but if you've got them written out kind of right there in front of you um, and you've practiced saying them, you can always come back to them. It's a great way to kind of keep the interview um, about what you want it to be about. Um, I think a lot of times in our communities, someone calls us and says, hey, what's going on out in your county? And it's easy to, um, you know, give them a list of all the events going on in the county right now. But what if we had taken the time to think of what are some issues going on in the county what would I like people to know it'd be a great way to say well you know um, we have a, a lot of events going on but something I'd really like to chat with you about is XYZ and here's what people you know here's how to um, you know take care of XYZ or better prevent XYZ whatever it is so it's a great way to bring people back into the um, kind of conversation and focus the conversation on what you want it to be about. So 
preparing your key messages beforehand um, is a great way to do that. I think Becky's now going to talk to you a little bit about um, the actual interview itself. Yes. You've gotten the call from the reporter or you've instigated the call. That's fine, too. We'll talk about that some more. But it's time for the interview, whether this is a newspaper or magazine person who's going to come talk to you or a radio person who calls you at the office or you're even on TV, whatever. These tips we really think apply, whether it's print or broadcast. So first of all, pause to gather your thoughts. Obviously, you can't do that if it's live TV or live radio, but that doesn't happen very often. In fact, have any of you ever had to do a live radio or TV? Just curious. I have. You have? Yes. Awesome. Okay. Great. Well, obviously pausing to gather your thoughts doesn't fly when it's live TV. But in most interviews that are recorded, don't worry about hurry hurrying and thinking, oh my gosh, I have to hurry up and respond. Just pause for a second and think about, okay, how do I want to respond to this question? And how do I want to, as Kelly said, bridge to my key messages? Also answer in complete sentences. I wasn't a reporter for very long, but I know I so appreciated it when a subject gave me a nice clean sentence, especially when I was in my radio and TV class. I didn't do that for my real job, but I didn't have to go back in and edit and splice tape. Yes, that's how old I am. We literally splice tape. Uh, but if you can provide that complete sentence, it just makes it that much easier for the reporter and the reporter will really appreciate it. So again, answering in complete sentences that bridges to your key messages. And keep your responses short. Even if it's a print interview, get to the point and then stop. Don't keep rambling. So even though we talk about 20 second sound bites, that applies to print too. Say what you want to and then wait for the next question or move on. So more about the interview itself. This kind of goes along with the stopping to pause. Don't panic if the reporter also pauses. The reporter might be trying to think of the next question. So just because it's quiet, don't think you have to fill that dead air. That gives you both a little bit of time to think. So don't be afraid of silence a little bit. Something we're notorious for in our work is acronyms. If you're out there spewing out CRP and FNEP and, uh, oh, everybody type in at least two acronyms from your program area for me. You're better at this than I am. Think of all the acronyms that we take for granted. FCS, absolutely. Does anybody else out there know what FCS stands for? Or is that more of an internal thing? So VFD, that's a good one. That is a hot topic right now. The producers hopefully know what that stands for, but if you're doing an interview with a mass media publication, the others may not have any idea what you're talking about. Ooh, thank you for writing that out, Kelly, because I'm not sure I would have gotten that with soybeans as this nematode. So we all work with acronyms, so try to avoid acronyms because Marissa, let's say you're being interviewed by the Bismarck Tribune and you say VFD. Well, to be honest, somebody might interpret that not so nice even. <laughs> but uh, we need to clarify what we're talking about. So try to avoid those acronyms. Also avoid speculation. The A&R agents and ag economists especially get caught with this one. You know, So what's the price of wheat going to be next summer? Well, who knows exactly? And you don't want to get yourself into a corner of, of saying something that may or may not come true. So we need to be educators, not predictors. Also, don't say no comment. What do you guys think when you read or hear somebody say no comment? This is the participation part. They're, they're mm -hmm. off-putting when they say no comment. Absolutely. Off-putting, guilty. That's my thought, Dean. It's like, okay, they're hiding something. Yeah, they're 
it's suspicious here. But, you know, if you really can't respond, and that may be the case, and that's fine. But say, you know, I, I don't have the information on that. Let me do some research, and I'll get back to you. Of course, some people always use the legal excuse that, well, I can't comment while it's under litigation or something. Thank heavens we in Extension don't have to worry about that one very often. But usually it's, I don't have that information, but let me do some research or find somebody else and get back to you. That's fine. That sounds a lot better than no comment. Also, our philosophy is nothing is off the record. When I was a reporter, if I heard something, it was in my brain. And I might not even remember where I got that information or where I heard that, but I might use it in a story down the road, even though somebody said, oh, that's off the record. You can't use that. It's like, just assume everything is on the record. And that's hard, I realize, for those of you who are in the smaller counties. You might be down at the cafe having coffee with the local editor, just kind of shooting the bull and say something that ends up on the front page. So that's a tricky situation I do realize in the smaller counties. So try to be careful what you say among those media folks. Let's talk specifically about TV. Have any of you ever done TV interviews? I think I asked about live, but I didn't ask if that was TV or radio. I know Dean's done TV. Marissa? Oh, you haven't had that opportunity, Marissa. Carmen, I'm not sure if you're there or typing, but I think you've been interviewed on TV. But let's talk about some specific TV interview tips. The question we get more than anything is where do I look? Do I look at the TV camera? Do I look at the interviewer? Do I look up? Do I look down? You know, where do I look? And it's easy for us to say, forget the cameras there. Obviously, you can't forget because you know you're being recorded. But try to forget the cameras there and just look at the person who's doing the interview. Try to just have a conversation with that person. Try to ignore the camera. Like I said, I realize easier said than done. But just visit with that interviewer. Often, we start swaying when we get nervous. And, you know, a TV screen's only that big, and you start swaying back and forth, and it's just accentuated on the screen. So one little trick is to just put one foot in front of the other one a little bit, and then you're a lot less likely to sway back and forth. It's not such a big deal in this day and age with the better equipment, but it just shows up better if you wear solid colors. And don't wear white, because cameras truly work on what they call white balance and white just shines it looks hot so try to avoid solid white of course I hope you'll wear your NDSU extension shirt or something like that if you know an interview is coming up but green does show up really well on camera yellow does too so a nice solid color like that works great even the jacket I have on today it's got a little bit of a print in it but it's not so bold and obnoxious and shimmery that it's obtrusive, hopefully. One of the tricky ones we have in our work is caps and hats. Because you're out at a field day or at a fair or something like that, and of course you want to keep the sun out of your eyes. But even when I just do this here in my office, look how dark it gets here. And that's really hard to photograph then for a TV interview. So if you can, Maybe even just suggest to the interviewer, hey, why don't we go in the barn or over here where it's shady under this tree or something, and then you might feel more comfortable taking off your hat. Now, on the other hand, I know hats are good branding, so I struggle with that one. But maybe keep on your hat, but just be in the shade so you don't have that light and dark. Because as a photographer, I've even struggled with that myself. Real challenge. And as you can tell, I can't talk without my hands and that's fine on TV because chances are you'll be cropped pretty closely just to head and shoulders maybe not but usually so go ahead and do whatever feels most natural for you chances are it won't be distracting so don't worry about it that's better than you panicking and standing there in what we call the fig leaf position and and being afraid to move at all and just looking very stiff and unnatural 
So does anybody have any questions or any additional thoughts about TV interviews before we move on? No? OK. okay. One of the most important things that Kelly and I, and Ellen too, but Ellen's out of the office here for a few days, we promote to making media interviews is just simply having those contacts, especially those of you in your county, get to know the local editor, the local radio program director, the TV program director, get to know those media folks. Don't be afraid to just call them up, introduce yourself, Carmen, I'm sure you're best buds probably with some of your local media, but build those relationships. Make sure they know you're a resource. Don't wait for them to call you, but you go ahead and call them. Hopefully you'll have a good enough relationship that they know they can pick up the phone and say, hey, I just heard we have this problem in the county. Do you know anything about it? Even if you don't, you might be able to lead them to somebody who does or vice versa where you feel comfortable maybe even texting the local media person and say, hey, we do have this problem in our county. I'd love to visit with you about it to get the word out. That can be as simple as that kind of a relationship. Sure, you can do an official news release, and that's fine. And I know some of the state staff are providing more news releases that you can use locally. It can be as simple as a media advisory, which that's a fancy word for what Kelly and I just on a piece of paper or in an email say who, what, where, when, why, and how. Here's what's happening. Here's who it's for. Here's why we're doing it. Here's when it'll happen. Very simple. It doesn't have to be written out in news release format even. If you want to provide information to the media, a simple fact sheet or, you know, please don't overwhelm them with, a 24 page publication but if that is the topic at hand let's just use emerald ash borer for an example if emerald ash borer heaven forbid hits your county you might want to take our publication and just highlight a few topics those key messages here's what people in our county can do to try to reduce the incidence of emerald ash borer with all of our news releases out of Ag Communication go via email and we don't put them in a PDF format. I know some people do that to make it look nice on letterhead. The media have told us they prefer just a simple email. They can copy paste and then do their editing. So again with that relationship with your local media ask them how they prefer to receive information from you. I would guess mostly it will be email but like we already talked about pick up the phone and say, hey, thought you might want to know about this. I can get some information or be glad to help you. Phone's always good to talk through the situation two-way. And we wanted to focus on mass media today, but yet think of all our newspapers and radio stations and TV stations that also have websites. They probably have Facebook pages. They probably have Twitter accounts. So your information can be multiplied beyond just the print newspaper, for example. And especially if there is an issue going, don't be afraid to go on to the Facebook page and post especially accurate information if somebody else is posting inaccurate. Don't be afraid to put our research-based educational information on those social media sites. So really, that sums up what we wanted to share with you. We didn't want to rush through it too fast, but yet we wanted to focus on some basic things that sometimes we even forget. In fact, I'll tell a story on myself. Last flood, 2011, I think, I went to a flood meeting and one of the TV stations saw I was taking notes, so they asked if I would talk to them and I said, sure, I'll see if I can practice what I preach. And I did okay on the first question. I, I really quickly thought, okay, here's what I want to get across. Here's what I want to say. Did fine, first question. Second one, I just stammered and stuttered and royally screwed it up. And I just said, whoa, can I do that over for you? I, I can do a better job for you and you'll get a better quote and I won't look stupid if that's what you choose to use on TV. And she said, oh, absolutely, that'd be great. And so 
the second one, my do-over, is what they used. And so I was so glad I said, eh, wait a minute, let's, let's do that over. So it worked out great. So we just want to wrap up with any discussion, any questions, any thoughts, any horror stories, any experiences like mine. You guys are all real quiet. Oh, well, we weren't going to turn this into a social media one, but why not? <laughs> Do you want to take that one, Kelly? Oh, sure. <laughs> well, I'll admit that um, I'm a little, we're a little bit of, Facebook Live novice, but it seems like as that's becoming more prevalent, um, that's something we should um, maybe be working on. And we are. We actually um, have now, the NDSU Extension Service has gone live on our Facebook page twice now. Um, what we're finding is that um, it's a great way to uh, have a conversation with people out there. Um, some of the challenges are in the uh, technology of it, just in terms of good sound, making sure that um, the sound is clear and crisp and um, has good quality. That's something we've struggled with a little bit, and so something we're working on. But we also recognize that going live on Facebook is a lot less prepared than, um, you know, people are used to seeing a little bit shakier of a camera or um, not the perfect background or the sound might not be quite right. And I think that's um, what kind of gives it a live quality. And so um, we have discussed a lot um, about Facebook Live, about how we can maybe start using it in extension a little bit more. Maybe that's as simple as being, especially for our um uh, county people, well, county people and our state specialists and those at our uh, research extension centers. Let's say you're out in the field this summer and or the spring and you see something and would like to talk about it. I think that, and you've got your phone or a tablet with you, I think that's a great way to um, on the fly quickly start a conversation about what you're seeing out in your area and, um, like I said, to to talk to your community about it. Um, you know, I think before you go live, you should definitely have a, um, something planned or prepare, have a key message. Not, um, I think it's because it's so easy to go live. We think, well, I'll just go live and have a, you know, wing just, it. just wing it. <laughs> Hope that someone gets on and asks me a question. I think, um, it's probably best to go live when you have an issue to talk about or something you'd like to share, a piece of education, and that you, you know, have developed a key message ahead of time. I think that's something very important that we don't just use it as a, hey, I better connect with my people, so I'll go live and see what pops up. Um, I think if we use it in a way that um, best fits our needs, then I think it can be used as a really great tool to connect with our people. Any other I agree with Kelly that the field example is wonderful. I think what's hard that we do so often in extension is just doing a meeting live with PowerPoint, you know, where you're depending on that because the quality is just really poor. It's hard to see and you don't know if you're focusing on the person presenting or the PowerPoint. If you really want to capture what you're teaching using a PowerPoint, let's just say, because probably 90% of our education is an extension with PowerPoint. So then I would instead recommend you just narrate the PowerPoint sitting at your desk and upload it. You'll have much, much better quality. The folks will be able to see your PowerPoint so much better than doing it on Facebook Live. But Kelly's example of you're out in the field, you found this bug or, or disease or whatever, that's a great short too I think a lot of Facebook lives I've seen already have been way too long just I didn't watch the whole thing I got off really mm -hmm. fast <laughs> mm -hmm. so great uh, other questions especially with the mass media 
Kelly's a social media pro, but I don't claim to be, so that's why we were kind of focusing on mass media today. What else? It's interesting, Dean, that you said live interviews are easier than those you prepare for. You just don't have time to freak out, or, <laughs> or you know they're more casual, maybe. I'm trying to think of the last time I've done a live one. It's been a long, long time, so I'm usually on the other end now. Maybe. <laughs> so does anybody have an example of a media interview that went well or did not go so well or ended up okay, like my flood meeting one that you'd like to share that the rest of us might learn from? We encourage you, Marissa, to incorporate the question into your answer. We should have pointed that out, if it's appropriate. I mean, we've all heard what we call the spin doctors, where you go, that's not even the question they ask, which may be true. But obviously, the person got their key message through, even if it wasn't what the reporter asked. But rather than repeating it in the form of a question, incorporate it into your answer and I won't be able to do this on the spur of the moment tell us about emerald ash borer emerald ash borer is a little green bug that can devastate ash trees so not just it's a little green bug that can devastate ash trees but incorporate the question into your answer does that make sense? So again, we talked about a complete sentence. So the reporter can use that chunk, whether it's print or broadcast, without having to paraphrase it because you provided a wonderful complete sentence. Anything else? We don't want to take too much of your time. Anything you want to share? or any questions or ideas for us? Anything we haven't covered that you have questions about? If not, I guess we'll go ahead and wrap it up. We're all busy people and have things to do. So thank you so very much for joining us today. Greatly appreciate it. This will be posted on the AgCom homepage. We already had two people say, oh, I can't make it. Will you record it? So we'll make that available to others. Thank you so very much for joining us. Thank you all. Have a great rest of your day.